Hello, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. Hope you're doing well wherever this podcast may find you. I hope you are doing swimmingly. How am I? All good, all things considered, I cannot complain. I'm all good. I can't complain. I'm all good. I cannot complain. Welcome to everybody in the stream chat joining in. I appreciate every one of you. Already have some bad news here. Wagwan in the stream chat for all my people. I do apologize. I hear some bad news already. Big up my guy Stephen Castaneda. Unfortunately, has come down with a bout of COVID. Stay strong, my friend. Stay flipping strong. Get those um got uh, I did some when I was ill, I didn't really I, I never got COVID. I'm sorry, COVID. I never actually caught COVID, I don't think. Um but when I did have some flu type like symptoms, I do like to soothe myself with a bit of ginger tea. I think ginger tea is absolutely delightful, honestly. Ginger tea is delightful. And, you know, st basically boiling up cloves of ginger. You can cut them up into smaller bits, shave them off a little bit, take some of the excess skin off of it. Not all of it, but just a little bit. So some of the juices kind of pour out, put it in a pot, hot or cold water, and obviously boil. Do you know what I mean? That was really, really flipping good. So um, that really did me a, a doobie. And if you're not really f that big of a fan of the ginger taste, then maybe squeezing a little bit of lemon in it or putting some honey in it can also help. But ginger tea, I found to be absolutely delightful. That really did kind of act like a warm hug and kind of comforted me when I was going through some tough times during my cold. So stay strong, Stephen Castaneda. Stay flipping strong. Drink that ginger tea. Drink that ginger blood clot tea. Bigger baby else in the stream chat. Appreciate you. I see you, Abe Martinez. Who said my sweater's gay? Big up Gui Wan. Big up Gui Wan Rogier. Whoever you are, G1 Roger, aren't you noticing the irony of you saying I have a gay sweater? My sweater might be LGBTQ coded, but your name might be gayer than my sweater, you know? And I've got a, quite a gay name. Look at my name. But your name actually might sound gayer than my name. It might be gayer than my sweater. So I love the irony. I love the irony of you pointing out that I might have an LGBTQ sweater. I might have a bunch of stick sweater. I love the irony of it because sir or madame, whoever you are, that name, G. Woon Rogier, sounds incredibly Bergheim. It sounds incredibly Studio 3054. It sounds like Adonis, you know? It sounds very hello. You know, you know what that sounds like. You know. You know, you recognize gay name to gay name. You know what I'll go on. You know what I'll go on. When people say, oh, what's your name? Ji Woon. Ji Woon. You know what happens when people say your name. Gay name to gay name. We, we, we share something there. Let's not be enemies. We share something. <laughs> big up, big up, big up. Imagine we'd get into a beef like, who's got a gayer name? <laughs> That's the new beef of 2024. Who's got the gayer name? G. Woon, Rogier, or Agostino Zinger? Who sounds more like a raging homosexual? <laughs> Who sounds more? <laughs> Who sounds like they've got a gaggle of toy boys in their apartment somewhere doing all sorts of manner of nonsense in the late nights? So who's got the worst? Who's got it worse when it comes to the G.A.Y. name? Hey, Who is an ally? Who is an ally? Who is an ally? Um, big up Quinn in the chat. I see you also. Hope you're good, my friend. Big up Andre in the chat. I see you also. Asada Z's. I see you also. Wagwan, Wagwan, Wagwan. So much stuff I want to talk to you about. So hope you're well. Hope you're good. Hope you're enjoying yourself. Hope you're well hydrated and well rested. As you can tell, I've been absolutely committed, committed, committed to my facial regime yes i know that sounds very gay but i've been very committed to my facial regime i have not missed a day i have not missed a day i have not missed a day every single day i'm flipping cleansing my face exfoliating my face applying toner applying serums right applying what's the thing snail what is it snail mucus applying vitamin c applying oils like i have not missed a single day bro a single day and you know what's funny you know what's funny i realized when i was applying it you know what i realized when i was doing my facials all this time now i understand why people get plastic surgery <laughs> now i understand why people get plastic surgery because at some point you're sitting there you're thinking hold on how many like there's only so much this is going to improve of my base level right 
if I'm not Leng oh, at my base level, if I'm not a buff ting at my base level, no amount of exfoliants, no amount of scrubs, no amount of cleansers, no amount of serums is going to make me look like a Leng ting. You know? Now I get why people just get surgery. Fuck this. I'm just going to tuck this in, fill this up, do this, do that, rip this open. It makes more sense because at least then, you know, your base level is pretty high. But if your base level from birth is quite low, what can you really do? Especially as a guy, what can you really do? You can get a haircut, cool. You can maybe improve your fitness and your health and shit, cool. But I've seen plenty of girls, I've seen plenty of girls turn away a dude, even if he has a six pack because he's clapped in the face. So what can you do as a guy? You can't use makeup. It's not socially acceptable for straight men to use makeup, which is annoying, by the way. That's annoying. I think one of the most annoying things about being a hetero, one of the no one of the annoying things about being a cis, one of the no annoying things about being a heteronormative male is that for some reason makeup and extensions aren't permitted. But if we could do makeup and extensions, come on, fellas. If we could do makeup and extensions, we'd all look fucking buff. All of us would look buff. If we could get extensions. If we could maybe fill some holes in our hair or add some, you know, volume and shit. If we could get makeup to like give ourselves cheekbones that we don't have, jawlines that we don't have. Yo, most of us would look lang, but we can't do it. So all we can do is push-ups, press-ups, you know, maybe go to a Turkish mandem and get them to give you one of those fucking, you know, um, it looks like it looks like it's a body. When he's like rubbing the thing all over you, burning you, like putting coals on you, pouring molten lava on you. That's the only way you're going to improve yourself after a certain level. And not everybody has, you know, the genetics necessary to work out and look good anyway. You could work out all the time and end up still looking like a dweeb. So you're left with really nothing. That's what I've, that's what I've come to the conclusion to after doing my facial regime for a prolonged period of time now. I'm like, you know what? Now I have more sympathy than ever. And I have no more understanding than ever for people out there who decide to go under the knife. Obviously, the under the knife thing is very personal. It's an insecurity thing. Sometimes there's no convincing you out of the way you see yourself in the mirror. I can understand why some people are like, you know what? This is the one thing that annoys me about myself, whether it's my nose, my lips, my face, my tongue, my gums, my toes, my fingers. Whatever your insecurity is, if you can get it done and it can make you feel better and you can sleep well at night, go cool, get it done. You only have one life to live. The last thing you want is to walk out of your house every single day, hating who you are, hating the skin you're in. Cool. If that's the path to you having some sort of self-love, cool. I get it. Go do your thing. But I just wish, I just wish it was socially acceptable for men to do some other tricks and trades because after haircuts, after improving your personal style, after maybe trying to improve your riz, because these days, guys don't even try and improve riz. Have you noticed that, by the way? Have you noticed that? With the whole fresh and fit, Sneeko, Zerka, all those dudes' movements, it's less about improving your riz and more so about like just being an obnoxious twat. Whenever you see clips of Zerka and they're like, oh my God, Zerka's a Riz God. It's just him saying really outlandish shit and being obnoxious and being super confident. It's not really what you describe as Riz as in like being charming, as in like having good banter, having good chat. You know what I mean? Like actually stuff that you'd want to maybe emulate. It's just him saying really crass stuff to women and being really confident about it and them kind of maybe being weak at the knees because this guy seems very confident and boastful about what he says. But a lot of their rhetoric when it comes to attracting the opposite sex just involves making money. They're the type who say, hey, make enough money to buy a Lamborghini and you won't ever need to work out again in your life. That's almost what they're doing. And it's a weird thing because it almost reminds me of like the boomer generation, kind of. Boomers were the same type of thing. Where it was like, it was like you know, what could you do for the woman? What could you, what could you provide? What could you offer? Do you have a good, you know... Do you have a healthy bank account? Do you have life insurance? Do you have a car? Do you have your own house now? Do you have a high paying job now? Can you can you support the wife and the kids and not have them work now? That's where they're kind of going. And I think that's a real detriment because I think part of the fun, part of the fun, part of the fun, part of the fun of like going out and trying to draw some things is the Riz game. I don't think it's fun. Personally, again, 
Maybe I'm wrong because I'm no, I'm a nobody and I'm just a regular schmegular guy. But I don't think it's that fun to be famous and have people just falling at your feet and just wanting to suck you off just because you're famous. Yes, it's probably quite nice to not have that pressure of having to try, of having to be on your best behavior, of having to try to impress somebody, of just always performing. If that, could, that kind of mental, you know, clarity or that that level where like you're you're not as pushed or maybe as tested as maybe the regular guy is probably quite nice but i'd imagine sometimes the fun of the game of going up to somebody and not knowing how it's going to go are they going to scream are they going to give you a high back are they going to turn around like all that danger that you run into of trying to approach somebody is actually what makes it fun if you just have money if you could just pull up to shoreditch in your fucking bugatti veyron if you can just pull up to Shoreditch in your Lambo, in your Ferrari, in your Range Rover Sport and shit, then what's the point? What's the point of being in the game? Sounds a bit boring to me. So I'd, I'd love it if those guys were more pushing the, hey, here's how to talk to women. Here's how to charm them. Here's how to approach anybody. Here's how to appeal to a, a large majority of people and make yourself desirable, whatever it may be. That would be way more um, entertaining or somewhat satisfying to watch than just seeing guys trying to amass as much wealth as possible through very unscrupulous means, by the way. They're doing it very unethically too. So there's, you know, crypto shit, NFT shit. They're selling you some course and some dodgy ebook, right? They're telling you to join their Telegram. They're amassing all these coins so that they can go and impress for what looks like 17-year-olds on kick. That's the funny thing as well, by the way, those type of guys. All of that money, all of that wealth, all of that fame, all of that clout, and you're doing it so you can smash 17-year-olds in Arizona. Really? You, you need to impress, like, come on, man. Come on. Come on. But again, what do I know? Absolutely nothing. Moving on to topics that concern me and are way more interesting. Can we talk about Cristiano Ronaldo for a second, please? Can we please, for a second, talk about CR7 and that performance against Savaka the other day? Can we speak about that? Can we speak about that, please? Can we speak about that clearly? Cool. Because for me, for me personally, that's what it means to be a GOAT. That's what it means to be one of the best players of all time. That's what it means to be clutch. That's what it means to be elite. That's what it means when you're at the top of the top, even when you're currently not. I think, I'm not going to lie, I honestly do think, right? I honestly do think Ronaldo actually played one of his best games. Like one of his be one of his better performances. It was actually one of his better performances against Slovenia. One of his better performances. He actually looked pretty decent. In this tournament so far, he's looked pretty anonymous. It's been quite sad to see. Like you can clearly see he's come to the end of the road. And it's not like through lack of trying. He's fit as a fiddle. He's probably in better shape now than he probably was when he was 25. But his body just can't do what he wants to do in his brain. And you see him in some instances, he comes short to receive the ball. And in days gone by, Ronaldo would come short to get the ball in midfield and just turn and run into space. He wouldn't be pinging the ball back and trying to play one-twos all the time. And now he does that. And sometimes he's got to the stage of his career where that kind of running short to get the ball and play back into midfield and then run into space, sometimes he miscontrols that. Sometimes the ball rolls under his feet. Sometimes the defender comes in and claps him from behind and takes him underneath from his ankles. And you're like, shit, bro. Back in the day, Ronaldo would have anticipated that. He would have skipped over the person's feet, the defender's feet, spun around, got the ball on the other side, pinged it on the right, and went into the box and then kind of tried to head the ball in as the cross was coming in. Nowadays, not so much. But I like how he is more understanding and accepting of where he is career-wise. And he's allowing the players around him to do their jobs. It seems like he's been given a free role. He doesn't have to press, which is what he was required to do at United. He doesn't have to do anything defensively. He just has to occupy the space where he is up front and in that kind of number 10 quasi position. And when the ball gets to him, they are hoping, because he's still an elite footballer, when he gets the ball in space, especially in front of goal, nine times out of ten he's going to score. Unfortunately, this game against Slovenia... He had a really good opportunity. I think it might have been in the just um, second half. It was the end of the, the, way, the end of normal time, actually. He could have won the game to the end of normal time. He gets the opportunity towards the left-hand side where I think in days gone by, doesn't matter, left or right foot, he's, you know, he's going to bury it. But he would have smashed it probably top bins. But he kind of kicked through it 
and he hit Oblak. And again, to be to be fair to Ronaldo too, he's also facing Oblak, who's one of the best goalkeepers in the world. One of the best goalkeepers in the world. So not only are you at the end of your career, but you're also facing one of the best goalkeepers of, in the world anyway. So clearly it's going to be difficult. And then he gets opportunity to score a penalty, dubious penalty, but he gets a penalty. He gets the opportunity to win it for Portugal in extra time. He misses that. The goalkeeper saves it, which is... You don't usually see a lot of Ronaldo penalties saved. I can't... I can't wish I knew the stats, but I'd imagine there's not many Ronaldo penalties that get saved. Most penalties from Ronaldo, he either misses as he misses the target or he scores. I don't remember many penalties where the goalkeeper saves them because he usually smashes them pretty hard into the side netting. And usually if you aim towards the side netting of a goal, that's usually a goal. And obviously that didn't happen this time. And he starts crying his eyes out. He is sobbing, literally sobbing. And I guess a lot of it is because he's not the guy that he once was. But I honestly do think being the extreme, hyper-competitive guy that he is, the reason why he was sobbing because he felt like he let everybody down. He still carries Portugal on his back, even though Portugal have a ton of attacking players, attacking talent, a ton of leaders in the team overall. That's one thing I really liked about Portugal. I feel like their personalities from Pepe to Bruno Fernandes to um, the other guy that plays at fucking City that plays at the back there. Um, you know, too many players to mention. They've got personalities and captains who don't have the captain's armband all over the squad. So even if they don't play that great football, I think mentality-wise, they've got a lot of leaders. Yeah, Ruben Diaz, sorry, that's it. Yeah, Ruben Diaz. They've got a lot of leaders on that pitch. And I think that's a necessary thing. And But the weird thing about it, Ronaldo breaks down and starts crying, even though he's got these leaders on the pitch. So it makes you think, wow, this guy's at the end of his career. He's finally at the place where he can take a step back. He can take a seat back and let the other players kind of shine and then him be the add-on, him be the, the, the chair on top of the cake and not be the star of the whole show and run everything through. Because there, there was a time that he, it felt like he was still trying to make everything run through him. I think now he accepts he's okay. He doesn't have to let it run through him. I think the decisive moment was that goal that he um, that he uh, assisted for, where in days gone by, he would have probably scored it himself, but he squared it into the middle and I think Bruno Fernandes um, finishes it in the goal. I think that's a clear indication of this change in mentality of Ronaldo and approach when it comes to games he's no longer you know hell-bent on being the main guy but in that position when he missed that penalty you could see deep down he still believes he's the main guy and he felt so guilty that he missed that penalty he thought he was gonna be the reason why Portugal went home and let's be honest Slovenia they, you know, they played all right but they weren't good enough to beat Portugal they probably didn't have the quality so he probably knew that in this type of game, especially at international football, at that level, especially in tournament football, last 16, you just have to win. Just get through to the next game. And it's a small margins. And he knows those type of chances don't are few and far between. And sometimes in games, football can be cruel mistress true. It could be your last European tournament, your last international tournament for your country. You miss that pen, you miss that shot, sorry. Um, towards the end of the normal time, you miss the penalty, and you can sometimes feel deep down, oh shit, this is going to be one of those games, isn't it? Slovenia are going to win. You could be like, oh damn, they're going to win. They're going to win. They're going to knock us out of this tournament. They're going to win, and they're going to knock us out, and I'm going to finish my career with everybody seeing me as a loser and as a failure. But then, the elite mindset, the championship mindset, the GOAT mindset, requires him to step up for his country when they need him most. Regular people, myself included, would have been okay if he decided, you know what, penalty shootouts, I'm not going to go first. Because I already missed, especially in extra time. It's not like he missed in, in normal time. He missed in extra time. So it was recently. All Black already had seen the whites of his eyes recently. He saved his penalty recently. He won that, he won that mental war between Cristiano Ronaldo recently. A regular person like you and I would have been okay with seeing Ronaldo go second. Go third, go fourth, or even take the fifth and last penalty for Portugal. That would have been perfectly okay to give him a breathing space, to get his mind right, to maybe confuse All Black a little bit. But no, Ronaldo decides, I'm taking that penalty first. I'm taking the first one. And he does it and he sends the keeper the wrong way. Are you insane? Are you insane? That is elite mindset. And immediately when he scored, no sue, just an apology to the fans. And that's why you can tell genuinely how much this motherfucker cares about football, how much he cares about winning. Still at this level, 
despite everything he's won, he's still playing. He's still playing, risking it all, putting it all on the line. When he hangs up his boots, he's going to be like, cool, I did it all. I bared my absolute soul. I gave everything to this beautiful game. And he ended up restoring everybody's happiness and everybody forgot about the fucking miss. And if anything, it set the precedent for Portugal to win the, obviously, the penalty shootout. But a big shout-out goes out to Diogo Costa. That Diogo Costa guy, he's looking at the real deal. A lot of people are saying that guy was a real deal, but he's looking at the real deal. We probably missed out on not buying him. If United were a big club, if United were a big club, what we would do is that we would sign Diogo Costa and have him compete with Andre Onana. That's what we would do. We would have Diogo Costa compete with Andre Onana for the number one position, at, um, you know, number one jersey, sorry, at United for being the starting goalkeeper. That's what we do if we were a big club. But we're not a big club, so we're going to have some bullshit, garbage, fucking, you know, second string goalkeeper that's never going to play. Onana's going to stink up the shop and have some clangers from here and there. But Diogo Costa was absolutely sensational. Free penalty saves free penalty saves free don't get me wrong the Slovenia penalties were disgustingly bad but still at that stage of the tournament free penalty saves man this Diogo Costa guy's looking at the truth he's going to be worth a lot of money especially after this tournament look at all the big saves the one-on-one yeah I forgot about the one-on-one against Sesco by the way Sesco looking very very mid very very mid a lot of hype around Sesco, and he's one of the up-and-coming young strikers everyone wants to sign. But he didn't look that great for Slovenia, especially that big chance that he got against um, Costa one-on-one. -on -one. I think Pepe stumbled or fumbled on the ball. He was getting cramped. He was really tired. His mind can he could basically see he lost concentration. He misses the ball. Um, Sesco runs onto it. Basically, runs one-on-one -on -one to Yoga Costa, and he just you know unfortunately doesn't slot it in, and Costa saves the goal with his feet. Kind of remind me of David De Gea. He's essentially David De Gea, but with better feet. Shot stopping ability is fucking 10 to 1. is up there. But he's basically David De Gea with better feet. Honestly, I would be so happy if United signed him and had him competing with Andre Onana. That's what a big club would do. But again, we don't do that. But anyway, CR7 forever. CR7 forever. What an elite mind. What an elite athlete. What an elite football player. What a fucking man. And I'm rooting for him and Portugal to win the Euros. I honestly am. I honestly, honestly, honestly am. What do you guys think about social media? I'm a little bit in a weird place with social media at the moment. I don't really use my Instagram for the most part. I sometimes check, you know, my Instagram here and there for DMs and shit. I sometimes will peruse the discovery page here and there. For the most part, I'm mostly on Twitter. And even that, I'm starting to wane off of using it too often. But I sometimes get a little bit exhausted and a little bit tired with social. That could be in part because of what I do. I create content. So a large part of creating content is kind of consuming content, checking the feed, checking the algorithm, seeing what's trending, seeing what people are talking about, and then using those, you know, things to be launch pads for your topics that you want to talk about, especially if you're reporting on certain things, whatever, you get your information from there. So maybe I'm in, I'm in a bit of a unique position because I make content. If you don't make content, maybe it's hot, easier to enjoy social media because all you're doing is consuming it. You're not putting it out there. But I've reached a point where I'm thinking to myself, you know what, going forward, I think I might have to pick and choose my platforms and just stick to two or one. So maybe I just stick to Twitter, maybe I just stick to Instagram, or I just stick to, but I don't add any on. I don't suddenly jump on TikTok or do this, whatever, because it's just too much. It's too much. Because I would hazard a guess. This is just my guess here. I would hazard a guess. The people who use TikTok, I would bet you, because I've used, I've browsed TikTok, I've used TikTok, right? I've got a TikTok, I don't really use it or whatever, but I've been on it, and I know how addicted the app is, is how well designed it is. And I bet you, people who use TikTok probably don't use any other social media app because it's so addictive. It's the same thing like with Instagram Reels. If you're on Instagram Reels all the time, you probably don't use TikTok either. I think because they consume so much of our time, it's very difficult anyway to spread your time evenly across all the social media apps facebook instagram twitter it's really hard to do it so you usually pick and choose which ones you want but there might come a point where you just don't want any you know that also could be the case where you just set up dummy accounts to maybe comment on things because i've seen them a lot i don't know about you guys but maybe because my twitter's like i've got the verified system i pay for that verified tick thing but i've noticed a lot of people have accounts that they don't even post on you go on their profile they've got no post they just use it to just maybe 
comment on other things or like things or just check the feed. So that might be a new trend happening. But all that to say, would you be interested in jumping on another social media app? Yeah, you heard it right. There's another social media app that is doing the way, you're doing the rounds on social media that's climbing up the charts. Um, I think it's number one app at the moment um, um, on flipping the app store in terms of social media apps and it's called No Space. It's founded by this lady called Tiffany Zong. Tiffany Zong has its app called No Space. The title from Business Insider is as follows. No Space is a new nostalgia film social media app for Gen Zs that's already got 500,000 person waiting list. So similar to like Clubhouse when that came on, the whole waiting listing was a big indication of just how many people wanted to use it. Clubhouse success was kind of, you know, because of covid and the lockdowns and all that shit but in general in general in general i'm i'm of the feeling that i've have a bit of social media platform fatigue i'm not too sure if i can handle more social media platforms if anything i would be more prone to ex i'd, I'd be more in favor of seeing apps like instagram go back to their roots and improve what they already have then I would go to an app that's trying to replace Instagram or trying to do what Instagram used to do. Honestly, if Instagram decided, hey, we're going to go back to our roots, we're going to try to emphasize photos and shit and photo sharing, we're going to not make it mostly a video platform, we're going to do all the things that everybody wants people to improve Instagram with when it comes to discoverability, engagement, blah, 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 blah. blah. We're going to improve the feed, all this malarkey. I'd be more prone to maybe going back there, more likely to going back. Well, I'm not too sure if I'd be likely to sign up for a whole new platform and get to know it, how to use it, checking in. Uh, it's just it's just too much. But let's read what they're doing anyway. Cursed the Business Insider. A new social media app targeting Gen Z's No Space is set to be released in June. The company told Business Insider. It calls itself the most social network as it prioritizes users socializing with friends over posting viral hits. No Space was founded by Tiffany Zong, a Gen Z herself. Zong is no stranger to the startup world. She founded Pineapple Capital, an early stage consumer VC firm, and Zebra IQ, a Gen Z intelligence and research company. Her new app jumps on Gen Z's love. How many times are they going to say Gen Z in this article? Is this a paid promotion piece? Gen Z, Gen Z, Gen Z, Gen Gen Z, 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 Like, fucking no. Hella buzzwords, isn't it? Why go on for this? Her new app jumps on the Gen Z's love of Y2K, harkens back to a simpler age of social media, and it's already racked up a wait list of 500,000 people, the company told Business Insider. Instead of stressing over carefully curated posts, the app encourages users to share their stream of consciousness, thoughts of what they're eating, gaming, streaming, reading, and watching. So basically, social media, right? Cool. The app is primarily text-based feed with the option to switch to seeing posts from just friends. Each profile is customizable. Users can choose colorful backgrounds and texts. They can share their relationship status and interests. And it's a lesser professional looking version of social media than a big incumbents. I'm not going to lie. I don't mind the, unifo the, the, unifam the uniformity of most social media apps. I don't mind that all you can do is change the style of font in your bio, but you can't change the background. You can't make it rain fucking daffodils and butterflies. I'm all over that. Like, I don't want you to pl auto play a song when I check your fucking profile. Like, fuck all that shit. Like, I'm okay to leave all that stuff in the past. I think it's pretty nice just to kind of, okay, the content is where your creativity goes into. Put the content out there, but let's not have your profile be like a fucking, you know, a MySpace page. That's a bit too much for me. I don't need that personally. I don't need that. I don't need that level of customability, customization or individuality to kind of make myself feel whole. I'm okay. They can be weird and authentic as they want on the app she previously told Business Insider. In recent years, social media users have become increasingly frustrated with their lack of fun online as professional posts have taken over socializing with friends. It's really bizarre to me that everyone's gone to this place in their mind that content has to be curated, says Tati Bruning, a Gen Z content creator previously told Business Insider. So curated that you can't show what you're cooking for dinner because that's not cool enough. That's a good point, though. That is a good point. As cringy as curated means, or as cringy as that, as overused as the word curated is at the moment, that is a good point. And it kind of reminds me of why I almost fell out of love with Instagram. Because I remember back in the day 
when Instagram was just like mobile, oh no, when Facebook was mobile uploads and when Instagram was mostly picture based, my Instagram, my original one, I think I might have purged it, but the original one I had, oh, I had thousands of nonsense pictures. Here's me on the bus with my feet. Here's a moleskin on a table with a pen. Here's me having a coffee. Here's me having a beer. Here's me having a beer. Another beer. More beer. This beer. Here's my hand. Here's a graffiti on the wall. I would be spamming my flipping Instagram account. Spamming my page with uploads. But just sharing. It was almost like a visual diary. Day to day. But you could basically trace what I was doing minute by minute based on what I was posting and shit. But after a while, it started to become... I don't know when this happened. But very quickly, Instagram turned into a place where people started showing off their lifestyle. It went from documenting your life, it went from providing people with a snapshot into your life to almost showing off the trappings of your life. Oh, here's what I get to do. Here's who I hang out with. Oh, you're working on a, on a Tuesday at 4 p.m. in the afternoon? Guess where I am? Seychelles. You're like, what the f you know what I mean? Like, all that sort of happening. Like, FOMO became like a big part of Instagram where before it wasn't. It was mostly about just sharing pictures and, you know, having cool filters and shit and whatever it may be. So maybe there is a need for those type of apps, maybe. Or, or, here's a really crazy idea. Maybe people should start posting that stuff on the platforms that already exist. Because I am noticing, maybe I'm wrong here, but I am noticing a lot of people on Twitter now known as X, are posting way more pictures of themselves. I'm seeing way more girls posting selfies. I'm seeing way more guys posting pictures of what they're actually doing and going out, whatever, slideshow. Here's my, what, um, April dump of all the four places they've been. That's been the highlight of the month so far. I'm seeing more of that on Twitter. Now, that could be also because Elon did a really clever thing where he took away the fucking... Um, ability for you to see who liked certain posts because it was being weaponized for at a certain point but it also allowed people to creep and to be a little bit more gung-ho and a little bit more free and loosey-goosey with the fucking double tap so maybe because of that it's then giving people more encouragement to start posting more of those type of things on there it could be a thing i could be stretching like I'm Odell Beckham reaching for a fucking football, but I could also be true because I'm very intelligent. Let's continue. No Space wants to recapture some of the magic social media apps like MySpace and early Facebook, which centered on friendships and making new connections. The app store preview shows that the users can pin a list of their close friends on their profile, much like MySpace top eight friends feature. I'm wondering if a lot of this has to just do with the whole like Y2K trend, isn't it? Because everybody's obsessed with looking like they were living in Y2K era and shit with their baggy jeans and their horrible frilly skirts and the shitty glasses and all that malarkey. People are now trying to opine for the trappings and the things that we had during those times, whether it's, you know, cyber shot cameras, whether it's certain social media platforms. And it's getting a little bit cringe. I've never partaken in that whole Y2K trend anyway. The max I've kind of done is wear those um, fake AliExpress Balenciaga glasses that are kind of taking inspiration from that, you know, Y2K millennium type of trend thing. But for the most part, I really do object to wearing clothes based on a certain, like wearing clothes like you're in a certain era or something. Like it's like style fancy dress. Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. And also, I lived it. I was around then. I was wearing those clothes then. I'm not going to go back and wear stuff then to appear cool to kids. Like, it just doesn't make sense. Like, I'm not a diddler. I think it's really odd when I see people my age and shit, like, wearing that sort of stuff and trying to be... Yeah, it's, un it's understandable if you're that, if you're young and you haven't experienced that shit. Cool. Wear your baggy jeans and your, and your Timberlands. But if you actually were there wearing jerseys, if you actually were there wearing all that cyber goth, all that sort of shit that we were wearing back in the day, all that Euro trash shit everyone was wearing, then just leave it where it was at. You don't need to suddenly start wearing that nowadays. Like, it's like seeing big women, like, wearing pedal pushers. It's like, bro, pedal pushers were whatever it wasn't a good thing it's just a weird place we're in now in the moment with fashion and culture but what do i know i digress 
remember how fun the internet was before all the uh, algos, well, before all the algos and ads. We do too, so we're bringing it back. The apps store's description, so he reads: Zong, the seasoned social media pro who knows how to appeal to Gen Z trends. Um, through her previous companies, she's advised advised companies such as Snapchat, Levi Strauss, Google, and how to reach a Gen Z audience. Yo, they might have mentioned the term Gen Z more than ten times in this two hundred and fifty word article it's absolutely insane how many times it said gen z god is this what you have to do to be a journalist fucking hell people crave connection more than ever says zong all the social media platforms are more so media than they are social that's why people hang out and comment sections of tiktok okay cool so i'm not too sure personally not for me i will do like i usually do with most social media apps i will obviously go over there and reserve my username just for the sake of reserving a username because it's nice sometimes to get a username you know a nice one you don't have to fucking have one with fucking numbers and underscores all over the place so i'll do that for username's sake but in terms of using it day to day probably not same reason why i haven't used tiktok and i haven't really jumped on there even though i'm sure there is much more room for me to grow and engagement and blah 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 it's just i don't know man i just can't be bothered with more social media apps if anything i need a bit more I need a little bit more quiet. I need a little bit more silence. I don't need more stimulation, more stimuli, actually. I don't need more of that. I need it to quieten down a bit and to slow down a bit. And the fact that I read books is a good thing because that allows me some time away from my phone and my laptop and shit. But I probably spend too much time on my phone and too much time on my laptop. I don't need more time on there. So for me, it's probably a no. It's not that compelling. And I think MySpace was a good, you know, was good when it was good. But we don't need a new MySpace. We don't need that. No one needs that personally. I don't think anyone wants to see... Do you really want to see your friend's customizable profile page? Do you really want to see what colors they think represents them? What designs they think represents them? Like, I don't want to see any of that shit. I don't want to see my friends try and code, HTML code their user page. It's going to drive me fucking insane. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't want that. I'd rather, I'd rather just see a uniform page, white background, dark background, depending on how I do my settings on my phone and shit. But I don't need to see your custom, your horrible customizable, um, you know, profile page because most people have horrible tastes, unfortunately um big up the stream chat well, well gone hope you're all good thank you for tuning in there yo well gone my guy stoic savage what's going on hope you're well brother hope you're well hope you're well hope you're well um what's going on young old vibes what's good what's good chris rizzi i see you hey martinez i see you dan so i see you hope you're all well everybody in the stream chat well gone to gui gui Kalix Kalitz Kalitz Kalitzo Kalitzo. sorry i forgot your name and i butchered it there as a poor fan, I remember the free saving Champions League last season. Diego Costa is goated. Yeah, exactly. 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 Big up. Big up. Gui. Big up. Gui. Big up. Gui. Appreciate you, brother. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Moving on. Most of you obviously know about Bronny James. LeBron James' son, Bronny, has been drafted for the Los Angeles Lakers. So he'll be playing alongside his dad next season. Pretty wild. This is actually the first time it's ever happened, you know? That's, that's the most insane thing that I found out. Again, I don't watch basketball. I don't know the rules. I'm just aware of, you know, the trends and the big news that comes out from it. So don't butcher me or come after me. But I was surprised to learn that this is the first time a father and son duo has ever played in the NBA at the same time. Well, maybe for the same team. Maybe it's happened before the NBA at the same time, but not the same team. But it's actually a pretty sick accomplishment. And LeBron should be fucking proud. I've also heard... I've also heard, I've also heard from people who know basketball that Bron James, that Bronny James isn't good, allegedly. Even though I remember there was like a bit of a promo run and a media run to convince people that he was the next coming of LeBron James, all of his college clips and shit. But allegedly people are saying that he's not even that good. Some people are suggesting that he's younger brother, the kid that wears the glasses. Um, allegedly he's actually better than, Le than Bronny James. But people are suggesting that this is nepotism. And he hasn't earned his spot there. And he's only playing there because LeBron James is obviously uh, playing at the, at the Lakers and has a very instrumental role to play there behind the scenes at the head office and shit. Blah, de, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of people are doubting whether or not he'll be successful at the Los Angeles Lakers. I personally think, this is what I personally think. I think it's really nice for a change to see nepotism in the black culture or whatever, especially with black people in general. I think this joke goes to show that you know, nepotism is sometimes dependent on who does it is annoying or not annoying because most of us are rooting for this. 
even if he ends up to be terrible, the fact that LeBron James is such a world-class, legendary basketball player and is such an influential person, he can pull such strings to get his son to play in the same basketball team as him in the NBA is elite. I think most black people are like, oh my God, that's what you'd want for your children. You want to be giving them any, every opportunity you can never have on a fucking silver platter because you know how hard, how hard life can be for someone that looks like you when you don't have the resources that you have. Cool, I get it. But I also think all the naysayers and all the doubters who are saying that he's not going to be a success, I think this is adding to and contributing to one of the best comeback proving my doubters wrong story of all time because imagine if Le if Bronny James actually turns out to be quite decent actually turns up to you know be take part in some monumental moments for the Lakers maybe contributes to certain wins maybe helps them to win a championship whatever it may be imagine what that Nike commercial wherever he's sponsored by will look like when they collate all the clips of people talking heads and pundits who say nepotism, he doesn't deserve it, not merit-based, blah, 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 bad for the sport, LeBron James' influence on the NBA, we need to have a conversation about him, blah, blah, blah. Imagine all the clips they could put together. And then at the end, you just got this still shot of LeBron James and his dad holding a trophy. Could you imagine how insane that would look at the end of the season? That would be so fucking cool. So he basically has an incredible bit of motivation to drive himself to something because everybody's already thinking you're going to be terrible because everybody that plays basketball, knows basketball inside and out, says you're not that good and says you're only there because of your father. Now you're there, prove them wrong, brother. Prove them blood clout wrong. And I would love to see it. That would be an incredible commercial to see. That would be an incredible ad to see somewhere, right? Never listen to the haters, never give in right never you're never as good as they say you are bad as they say you are perseverance and you are saying right do you know what I mean like huh come again Woo! that'd be so cool reading the article courtesy of the bbc i'll get through doubters says bronny james bronny james understands some people believe he was only drafted to los angeles lakers because of his legendary father lebron but he says he will get through the negative talk the 19 year old is a 55th choice god damn that's like a that's a low number, isn't it? That's a low number. Everyone always, you know, lionizes the first choice. So if you're 55th choice, that's a that's a lot to come back to. But again, more motivation chips to kind of keep him going. Um, he was the 55th choice of the draft in New York on Thursday after weeks of speculation about which team he would end up at. No father-son pairing has played together in the, Los Ange in the National Basketball Association. For sure, there's amplified amount of pressure, says James on first on tuesday i've already seen it on social media and the internet talk about how i might not deserve an opportunity but i've been dealing with stuff like this my whole life so it's nothing different it's more amplified for sure but i'll get through it that's actually true he actually has been for better or worse an athlete under scrutiny under the magnifying glass ever since he was born ever since he's showed potential to play basketball ever since he started to play college basketball he's actually had crazy pressure he's had people watching him in stands like you know i won't say hundreds and thousands but you know hundreds maybe some thousands so he's been he's played under some bright lights so it's not like he's coming into it and he's a complete fish out of water he's you know he's gonna be well adjusted so he might and you think a lot of athletes say a lot of athletes when you hear them talk about their come up a lot of athletes say most of the success in professional sports is mental because at some point everyone's got talent you're all amazing you're all good at what you do at some point the differentiating factor is going to be what's going on in your brain how are you able to handle pressure and all that malarkey so maybe this kid might have a crazy advantage over a lot of people just because he is lebron james son so he can somewhat handle that attention and that scrutiny more than a regular person. Who knows? Who knows? James completed his first year of college basketball with the University of South Carolina Trojans, where he averaged 4.8 points and 2.1 assists per game. His season was cut short because of a cardiac arrest. Oh, shit, I forgot about that. Yeah, he came back from cardiac arrest as well, didn't he? Fucking hell, 18 years old getting cut. Kind of, like, this guy might be a bit of a mentality soldier. He might be a bit of a mentality warrior. People might be doubting this kid. He's had to come back from some crazy... Like, it's not easy being the kid of somebody as legendary as LeBron, then having the cardiac arrest thing, then coming back from that, like, 
Ooh, it's a big deal, bro. So he might he might actually be a lot more mentally tough than a lot of people actually give him credit for, which might actually help him at the top echelons of the game. His season was cut short because of cardiac arrest and Lakers head coach JJ Redick believes that he has a huge potential to become an excellent NBA player. <laughs> JJ Redick, who also happens to be podcast co-host of LeBron James, his dad. <laughs> I love it. I love it, man. Honestly, when you're rich and you're famous, opportunities just beget more opportunities, isn't it? Like, what your your dad happens to be happens to have a podcast with the coach of the team that you want to play for. Man, get in, man. Put a bib on. Put a vest on, man. Play, 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 play. Come in, come in, come in, come in, come in. Like, honestly, life is so sweet. <laughs> I love it. His base level of feel, athleticism, and point of attack, defending and shooting and passing. There's a lot of like about his game, says Riddick. As we build out our player development program holistically, he's going to be a great opportunity to become an excellent NBA player. And that's probably the goal. It doesn't matter if he doesn't become a success at the Los Angeles Lakers. If he can go on to have a decent NBA, <gasps> a decent NBA career, LeBron James will be happy. I'm sure LeBron James will be happy too. If he goes on to have a decent career where he can play less, you know, 10 seasons is a long time, but let's say he gets five or more. Like, that's a good fucking run. That's a good fucking run. And he's still got all these other, opp other opportunities outside of basketball. He streams, I think, a lot as well. People like him on there. He's clearly, a, you know, quite a personable dude and shit. Comes across well on camera. You know, he's and obviously he's fucking the son of LeBron James, so he's set up anyway for life. You know, he's the son of a billionaire. But God, man, like, I'm actually curious to see how it works out. I'm actually curious. I actually am eager to see him prove the doubt was wrong, even if he is terrible. Just the fact that he's got that mindset and he's been through what he's been through as young as he is, I think he's going to surprise some people. Again, I don't know much about basketball. I could be fucking wrong, but I think Bronny James may surprise a few people out there. So um, props to Bronny James. Hopefully he does prove people wrong. Hopefully he does go on to prove a bunch of people wrong. Can we talk about House of the Dragon, please? Cool. House of the Dragon is fucking phenomenal. I'm not going to spoil too much, but House of the Dragon season two is phenomenal. Some of the character development, some of the writing, some of the acting. Wow. It's almost restored my faith in that whole Game of Thrones universe thing. But it's also reminded me just how disappointing it was how game of thrones ended those last four seasons like they were so bad and i think all of us can agree those last four seasons were so bad they ruined the top tier high caliber first four seasons that's how bad they were so much so that i think a lot of people myself included i've never gone back to rewatch those seasons even the good ones that's how bad those last four ones they kind of tainted such a good show that it's hard to go back and watch it because you know what you're gonna get going forward it's almost like prison break Prison Break season one was so elite, it's hard to rewatch it because you know how terrible season two was in comparison. But wow, House of the Dragon is incredible. One of my favorite scenes is the, I think, is episode two or episode one, where Otto Hightower has an argument with Aegon. I'll just leave it at that. And he's frustrated. And it's really cool because in this scene, you can see that he's exasperated, like he's fed up of playing the, you know, the house of cards. He's play, fed up of playing the, the game of whispers and manipulation in the background. He's clearly seeing that there's a limit to that stuff when people's emotions get involved. He's clearly seeing once the horse has been bolted, it's over. I can't control anything more. Everything's going to be what it's going to be. And he's just letting all that frustration out against with Aegon in this conversation. And it's an incredible scene. It really flipping is incredible. He's exasperated. He's annoyed. He's frustrated. He's angry. And Aegon is also angry and upset that Otto Aitara doesn't get what he's talking about. It's an incredible fucking scene. Really fucking poignant. But one of my favorite scenes, one of my favorite scenes is from the recent episode that features Rhaenyris, Rhaenyra or Renega, however you say her name, and Alison. And it's an amazing scene because it was quite hard to watch at times because there was a part in it where they basically talk about essentially, for lack of a, you know, not to spoil, but they basically talk about how 
sometimes it's too late to turn back. It's just too late. Sometimes when things go so one way, you just have to deal with the consequences. And I think I've kind of come to that realization myself in my adult age, where sometimes my actions, no matter how well intended, will have consequences. And you have to deal with those consequences one way or another. No amount of apologies, no amount of clarifications, no amount of explanations are ever going to make it okay. It's already done. And sometimes, sometimes, the really annoying thing is that sometimes you can get to a point in life where you fall out with somebody. You fall out with somebody and so much time passes in between. So much drama happens. It feels real, but you forgot the reason why you guys don't talk anymore. You actually don't remember. And it reminded me a lot of my recent, you know, troubling situation where a close former friend of mine passed away. And it was really sad because... We hadn't spoken for a while prior to this person passing away. And I remember feeling a bit of a fraud for even posting about the person. That's probably maybe part of the reason why I didn't go to the funeral, even though I regret not going. But I just felt like a bit of a fraud because we never really spoke. We clearly fell out, but I don't remember why we fell out. You know, I don't remember exactly the reason why. But at one point, we were very close. That's why when I was looking through the pictures of the stuff to post as a tribute, I was like, wow. I forgot how close we actually were. Like, that was actually one of my very, very close friends. And it just all kind of fell apart. But then you forget. You forget. You forget. You forget, really, why you don't talk anymore. And sometimes you think to yourself, rah, man, life is so short and it really isn't necessary. And it almost makes you think about, this is another side thing, honestly, right? But I remember I was watching this stream. And it had the, I think it was on No Jumper or something. And there was a guy on there. No, it wasn't No Jumper. It was back on Fig, I think. Was it No Jumper? Whatever it was. It was some show in that universe of people. And there was a guy on there that had beef with um, WAC 100. And he, he happened to like have some beef with WAC 100. The host of the show, I think it might have been Community. That's it. I think it might have been Community with AD and Pun. And Ace Boy Pun. So there's a guy on there they're interviewing. He has some beef with WAC 100. Um, AD and Pun decide for good podcast and content, let's call Wack 100 on the phone. And if you know anything about Wack 100, he's similar to like Charleston White. He's all about the drama. He's all about the aggression. He's all about the niggery behavior. So you just assume that he was going to get on, on the phone and you find out who, why they're calling him. He was just going to crash out. Instead, Wack 100 actually like, no, nah, man, it's all good. I understand why that guy was annoyed at me. I get why he didn't like me. I get why he had a problem with me, but I've watched some of his content. I've heard from some people that he's a good person, blah, blah, blah. And he legitimately surprised the entire room, like, whoa. And just completely deaded the beef to the point where, where they asked the guy, hey, what do you think of what Wack 100 said? And the guy in the studio was like, you know what? I have to be a real guy and just say, the beef is squashed. How can I respond in aggression when he comes on the phone like this and is basically so like apologetic? And it's basically extending the olive branch. I'd be an idiot to respond to that with aggression. And it was like, wow, what a surprise. But it made me think, you know what? That is actually how most, how most, how most those situations get dealt with. If you really want to move on, it actually does take one person to maybe put their pride and ego to one side and be like, you know what? Is this really that serious? Has blood been spilled? Have family members been disrespected and shit? No then it's you know it's workable we can we can get around this we can get around this and even if blood has been spilled there is a way to get around it also but it takes one person to be like you know what let me be the grown-up or not grown-up let me be the person that can put my ego to one side so that we can come to the middle because unfortunately that whole phrase of meet each other in the middle doesn't really exist in the real world it takes one person to put their ego to a side and walk in the middle to get the other person to meet them in the middle. But you don't both go and meet each other in the middle. That's not how it works out. Especially nowadays. Everybody thinks they're fucking right. I'm a good example of it, right? I've got a fucking podcast. I'm always screaming. I'm always shouting. I'm very loud and wrong most of the times. And I think we're mostly like that. Where I think, I don't know if it's because of social media and we've all got our own acts and stuff, but we're all a lot more stubborn than we were maybe many years prior. So it's very difficult to get people to meet each other in the middle at the same time. You need one person to go to the middle and the other person be like, you know what? I can't look like a fucking, you know, petty person. I can't look like an idiot. 
I can't look like I'm not mature. I'm going to then meet him in the middle and then you let bygones be bygones. And I think that's why I took from this Alison and Rhaenyra, um scene at the end of episode three. Like, it made me think, man, Jesus, man, most beefs, most falling outs can really be talked through. And when you don't talk through them and you let time pass in between without communication, it can sometimes build up. And sometimes it doesn't take people. It doesn't take people whispering in your ear. It just takes time. If you allow enough time without speaking to somebody and sorting things out, that gap in between, people can start making up their own conclusions about why you're not talking to them. They can start creating their own narratives, their own fantasies, you know, their own storylines, their own reasons why. And nowadays, considering how stubborn we all are, they're not going to let that go. They won't let that go. And when it comes to the point of you trying to reconcile, it'll be too far gone by then. So... That's what it made me realize when I watched it. I was like, wow, man. Wow. Be careful how you approach relationships and, and situations and friendships because sometimes when stuff is too far gone, the consequences to it can be lethal. But I do love, I do love in the House of Dragon how there's always a consequence for each action. I think most actions in game in House of Dragon, even the incidents, in, even the crazy incident that happened with the baby. I think most of the actions in these series are very much justifiable in, in like, you know, in a silo. They're kind of justifiable. You can find reasons and grounds for everything that somebody does. But I love how everything they do or everything someone does has a reaction. You can't stop that from happening, no matter how justifiable. Because I think that's what happens to a lot of shows and why they're a bit naff. They're not rooted in realism because realism is like that reality is like that like you can go and you know uh murder the abuser of somebody in your family but the consequences are you doing that is good because you've uh, you know taken somebody off the earth that abused somebody in your family that hurt you and shit but then the consequences are you're gonna go to prison that might actually lead to the breakdown of your family you might destroy your future you might destroy that family. You, don't, you, you know what I mean? There might, all these things are going to happen, but in, uh, in, in, in isolation, what you did was right, but you can't stop the ripple effects of your actions. And I love that in Game of Thrones, that's always at the core of what they do. And I love how they just follow through it anyway. They're all, most of them are very emotional, very um, quick to anger. They don't really have any restraint. And they always kind of go with their first instinct, which sometimes is the right thing, but it pans out to be the wrong thing and ends up hurting way more people. I absolutely love it. It's so amazing. I really do recommend you check out House of the Dragon season two. It's absolutely phenomenal. Moving on. Moving on. Can we please talk about the HMP Wandsworth prison guard officer woman? who smashed that guy in her cellmate once again, please. Can we update ourselves on that once again? Can we talk about that once again, please? Because like I said previously, that was one of the most hottest and most disturbing videos I've ever seen in my entire life. The most hottest and the most disturbing video I've seen in my entire life. And this update will make you angry. If you're a man, this update will make you so angry. I found out, I've learned through my browsing of Reddit, through my browsing of Twitter, I found out some interesting details about this young lady, this prison officer that gave up her cheeks in a prison cell to a prisoner and let herself be filmed and shit. I found some very disturbing details. The first detail I found out that will make you angry as Mandem. Do you know why she got caught? Do you know why that video leaked? The other guy in the cell. The Asian dude who's smoking a joint, recording his friend, you know, smashing the prison officer. He's the one that leaked the video. And you know why he leaked the video? He leaked the video to, because he was blackmailing the police officer. He was trying to get her to fuck him too, but she didn't want to. And then eventually he got pissed off and leaked it. It wasn't even the guy that leaked the video. It wasn't even the woman that leaked the video. It was the guy, the celly, the cellmate that was in there smoking the joint, zooming in on his friend's cock and shit as he's banging this girl behind the fucking door that leaked it because she wouldn't fuck him as well. Oh my God. How beta could you get? How much of a loser could you be as a dude to fuck up the situation? Not only for your cellmate, also for the woman and also for yourself. 
because you were so quick and so eager because there's a possibility there's a possibility that she might have gave up the cheeks to him later on but he was too thirsty too hungry because if that's me and that's that situation i would think to myself more than likely this woman doesn't have much scruples anyway because that she's doing this maybe in time i could get that if i want to maybe but play it cool relax you're already in the cell you already got that privileged position of seeing it with your own eyes. You don't probably you probably don't need to record it, but if you want to record it, fair enough. I don't like that he's like very much there. Like he, he's not even like trying to like lie down and act like he's not really watching and shit. He's like really watching. Like I don't like that. That's a bit much for me personally, but fair enough. Prison shit, you know, you're in there for a long time. Maybe the politics around that is all different, right? Cool. Because you have to learn to shit in front of your cellmate and all that shit. Have your legs spread out and hear the blop, blop, blop as they're shitting. It's all different, you know, politics and way of moving and shit. The fact that they allowed you to be in the cell with them or the fact that you were in there and you're allowed to record should have been good enough for most people. Okay, cool. I get to sit here. I get to record. I get to see this in 4K, hang out and shit, bust something, you know what I mean? Rub something out or whatever. Whatever you man do. But then to go as far as try to blackmail the girl to get you to smash as well is so deplorable and to me speaks to the lack of riz and the lack of game that dudes have in general this is what it speaks to this is like the the andrew tatification of um attraction of seduction of male and female interactions all of these dudes don't really know how to talk and game and riz people like how could you how how could you get in a position anyway where you get turned down by someone like that anyway personally how is that possible? Because you're that repulsive that somebody that is engaging in that kind of lifestyle, who's okay to do that kind of thing on camera, still turns you down. That must mean you have minus 10 game. Your game must be awful to the point where she's like, you know what? Nah, I'm okay to do a lot of like down bad stuff, but I'm not going to go that way, which is wild. The other thing I found out, which is insane about this story, allegedly the guy that's smashing the, the police officer, guess what? That was only his fourth week in prison, allegedly. Allegedly, he was in there for like four to six years for some robberies he was doing, really down bad, slimy shit, like robbing people's, you know, possessions and jewelry and stuff. Really horrible shit, in my personal opinion. Rob people of their stuff is down bad. If you're going to rob, rob from corporations and do like fraud and shit, but going in people's houses and stealing their handbags and watches, like that's some bummy shit. I don't care what stuff you're getting, that's bum shit. But he's in there for like four to six years allegedly he smashes this police officer in the only the fourth week of him being in prison he somehow is able to find a situation where he finds this portuguese baddie who is also a sex worker and also here's the other detail that's, that's so infuriating if you're the guy and that guy snitched allegedly this woman has a partner has a husband whatever they are in a polyamorous relationship they are swingers. They engage in this stuff anyway. So the guy was cool. Her guy was cool with what she was doing. And the Asian dude who was recording them fucked it for everybody. He fucked it for the cuck dude who's on the outside enjoying the videos. He fucked it for the woman. She's enjoying it in the moment. He fucked it for the prisoner who's only in there for four weeks and clapping cheeks. He fucked it for maybe other prisoners in there who maybe could have gotten it down the line. He fucked it for everybody because she wouldn't smash him in that instant, maybe. Because most likely, you know, maybe after, because I, I, I don't know, I think there's an extended version of the video. I've only watched the, like the two minute version, but I heard there's a longer one. Maybe at the end of the original video, he maybe tries to get his piece in as well. Just ain't gonna work that way, and it? Like, it's just, I don't know. There's not, even in life, I don't know about you guys if you believe this, but even in life, there's not many girls out there that are gonna be happy to have trains run on them. Even in life, even in life, even in life. But especially in that situation, it's very rare she's going to be able to be like, okay, cool, I smashed your homie in the cell. Now I'm ready to go with you. It's just not going to happen in that instance. Relax, bro. Take your foot off the pedal. Chill, man. Chill. You already got the video anyway. Chill, relax. But no, nah, he was too greedy, too hungry, too thirsty. He couldn't drink a glass of water. He tried to blackmail the girl. And to be fair as well, that proves that that guy is a... Uh, piece of shit and clapped and a scumbag because this woman was willing to risk her career willing to risk exposure by turning him down 
She was like, under no circumstances am I fucking you also. <laughs> I love it. She was so steadfast in her decision. I will not fuck you. I don't care. You can release this video. It could result in me going to prison. I could maybe lose my, you know, my right to travel. I could be publicly embarrassed, right? I could get exposed. Everything. I don't care. I am not going to do it. You're that repulsive. That's a wild shit, man. When I found out, I was like, excuse me? Because at first, I don't know why, I, f I just assumed it was a police officer. Maybe she got searched or maybe the police did that thing where they, you know, they kind of searched rooms, ran cells, sorry, randomly, and they found the phone, that they found the stuff on the phone. Maybe that was a thing. But no, it was actually the Asian dude smoking a joint who's recording, who's the one that leaked it because he was blackmailing this woman and she wouldn't give up the cheeks. Wild, isn't it? wild 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 and the other update here courtesy of the daily mail is that allegedly the dude that was smashing the cheeks he's not going to be prosecuted because he's a victim <laughs> allegedly he's classed as a victim so he's not going to be prosecuted it says victims of a prisoner who was filmed allegedly having sex with a female guard have slammed reports that he will not see further punishment claiming this is not what we thought it would meant to get a hard time in prison linton Warwick, 36 of west london was seen in a clip filmed in a smuggled phone appearing to have sex with a prison officer linda de souza de abru or linda linda de souza abru the incident involving the prolific burglar who's currently serving four years and nine months led to a police investigation with mary de souza um charged with misconduct in the public office the con who was jailed after he stole sixty-five thousand worth of goods from a safe in a luxury kensington flat was put in segregation but it's unlikely to face any further punishment and is not under police for investigation he's probably walking around that prison cell like a king like a king one victim who was targeted by Weirick in january said i was aware of the video i just don't know what that was our burglar. The whole thing seems surreal. This is not what we thought it meant to get a hard time in prison. That's a fucking incredible pun, by the way. That's sunworthy, isn't it? Hard time in prison. That is fucking the sunworthy. That is so trashy. <laughs> it continues. There's there's a young lady. Um, there's her leaving the thing, kind of half smiling, looking kind of embarrassed. It sounds like the prison officer is the only one being punished too. Um, Wirik had broken into the woman's home. Well, Wirik had broken into the woman's home while she was having building works done, but only managed to steal a few drills. Before, oh my, yeah, this guy's a bum, isn't it? He stole drills. <laughs> he stole drills to sell to cash converters and shit. Wow. Officers had caught him because of the ankle tag he was wearing. The woman explained, adding, I don't think he's the sharpest tool in a box. This guy was doing burglaries while on tag. No wonder he was okay with smashing a prison officer in the prison cell with his bare face, no fucking belly. No wonder. This guy is really about that life. Home burglaries while on tag. Wow. After one of his victims who said his, um, his bike was stolen, he stole drills, bikes, handbags. Um, he said he definitely is not the smartest cookie if he's just targeting people on his doorstep. I can see why police managed to catch him. It's hardly justice, though. It's, it's, it's having fun in prison. If he's having fun in prison, it comes as Mel 1 revealed that Weirik's partner is seven months pregnant and went into hospital after suffering from stress, fearing she could go into premature labor. To be fair, though, she should have been stressed that she was, you know, getting done up by a guy that was stealing people's drill bits and stuff and bags for a living because it's unlikely this woman did not know the lifestyle this guy was leading so this whole sympathy tour that she's going on at the moment about this induced labor because the stress is like bruh bruh you are with a fucking criminal like he's probably a career criminal too no offense to the guy right he's probably a career criminal too this probably isn't his first offense so you know let's relax with this sympathy talk because you went to labor like maybe choose your partners better in it maybe i don't know what do i know a source close to her said this is the last thing that she needs in her condition it's extremely upsetting this video has affected her health and she's hospitalized at the weekend through stress she fears it's going to be a premature labor hopefully not hopefully the baby's okay and shit fair enough but you know hey you should be more nervous that you're bringing a kid into the world with a guy that's occupation is robbing people Weirik was jailed for four and a half years for burglary um, at a dwelling and a theft on June 7th in Kensington Crown Court. Look at her, man. She was actually trying to lead the country. No, that's her. That's her there. There's, that's, this screen grab is her. I guess that's probably her mum. That's her there. She was legitimately trying to leave the country. <laughs> so funny. Oh, 
there's a done as well, right? <laughs> oh, what a fucking legendary story. But yeah, that Asian dude, man. I think in life, that's why I've always said, I think in life, right? I think it's really important. I think it's super important for dudes to know how to get rejected. I think it's really important to handle rejection from a girl that you deem to be ugly, from a girl you deem to be fat, from a girl you used to smash, but then changes her mind and doesn't want to smash anymore. From a girl you did some really horrendous, deplorable, hell-worthy things with, and then they suddenly see, you know, they f suddenly find themselves in a new relationship and suddenly they look at you like you're a disgusting person. Being able to handle rejection in those different scenarios strengthens you, makes you a far better person, makes you a far better gentleman, st makes you far less emotional makes you know how to deal with your emotions that situation because it's a really hard thing to kind of figure out in your brain as a dude because as a dude we're neanderthals we're fucking cavemen we're very binary in our thinking we see our guy in the cell clapping cheeks we're like i want some you just think you're entitled to it i want that when the person says no you're almost offended you're like what but you're a slag how can i not fuck you if you're fucking my guy in the cell on video you can't comprehend it. But this is normal. Not everyone's going to want, like, it doesn't matter what she's doing with that person. That's what she's doing with that person. That doesn't mean it's going to have any inkling, any effect on what you can do. If anything, it's probably going to make what you want to do harder. <laughs> if anything, it's probably going to make what you want to do harder. So you have to have to find out how to deal with those emotions. You're going to have to sometimes, somehow, find the tools to fucking figure out that shit so you don't become one of those dudes that's like, oh, you're ugly anyway, or you start getting aggressive, or you start getting violent, or you start cussing people out. No, 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 that's lame. You have to know to handle rejection with grace, like a gentleman, like a grown-up. Okay, no problem, I understand, and just keep it moving. Because in this situation, I honestly do think, even though this woman <laughs> was willing to lose her career and risk her freedom by telling that guy no, I think if he played his cards right, he might have had a chance if he was chill. But he was just too thirsty. You could tell from the way he was recording. He was all up in there. Like, he was... I thought at one point he was going to pull his guy's piece out and put it back in again or something. Like, he was way too close, way too involved. He wasn't chill enough. He wasn't, like, crawling on, a, on the bed and just having a... Like, he was just way too involved already. Too hungry, too thirsty. And women... You know what I mean? That first, woo, stinky, ee, ew, brother, ew. Ew. Brother, ew. What's that? What's that, brother? Even if she's a slag, she's like, ew, man, you're too hungry. Ew. Relax, bro, relax, relax. And I bet you even more, if you're a woman like her, who participates in swinger stuff, you're a bit free with your loving. You you know what thirst and hunger and desperation looks like. You run away from it. So that that's probably why you're more attuned to it. You're probably used to people watching you doing stuff. But when there's someone a bit thirsty, too hungry, you're like, Dios mio. See, I mean, you, you don't want none of that. None of that. So he, he just fumbled it for himself. But I think a lot of it comes down to because guys don't know how to handle rejection from people who they deem to be I wouldn't say lower than, but they, they deem, they think like they're entitled to whatever they're entitled to. That's why it's important to get rejected by a fat chick. Get rejected by a fat chick. That will do some madness to your self-confidence, to your self-worth. It will really play with your brain. It will really play with your confidence. It will really play with your sense of perception. Be like, hold on, what? Do you know what I mean? Like someone you deem to be ugly, like what? Someone that you might have smashed before previously easily say, nah, turn the tap off. Because girls are much better at doing that than boys, by the way. Girls can turn the tap off and never turn it back on again. But guys always are like, you know, they always leave that fucking door open. I mean, they're always fucking, always leaving that door open. 10 years down the line, 20 years, 50 years, that door is always fucking open. When a girl closes it, that string is shut. So sometimes that can be hard to deal with. But it's important to know how to deal with it properly, like a gentleman. Like a guy, man, like a don, just to be like, okay, she said no, it's perfectly okay. Just because she's engaging in sex work, just because she was smashing my friend on camera in front of me, it doesn't mean I'm entitled to anything. I asked, she said no, it's perfectly fine. It's chill, it's okay. 
don't take it personal. Even though it is personal. Even though she's basically saying she will never do you and it's personal, don't take it personal. Just take it on the chin and keep it moving. And who knows? Maybe acting chill and acting like you don't really care. You know, like back in the day, how you used to turn your, your PlayStation on and you used to fucking look around the room like you didn't really like care that like you're going to play it or not. Just waiting for the ding. Maybe acting chill about it and not really oogling at her, not really like showing any love. And Maybe that might work out. You never know. But one thing I know that doesn't work is trying to blackmail people. Blackmailing people for cheeks. That's some lame ass sh Blackmailing people for cheeks is some lame ass sh But again, what do I know? Absolutely nothing. Cool. Moving on from that. Moving on from that. Can we please? Can we please? Can we please talk about one of the most important videos that I've seen in my entire time creating content online and a video that I think perfectly encapsulates where we are currently in culture and this video made me cringe so badly I had to hide under my duvet for basically a day and because I had to hide under the duvet for basically a day when I watched this video you also have to watch this video and hide under a duvet, under your hood, under your jumper, the same way I did also. You're not going to escape it. If I had to cringe, you have to cringe also. And if you're wondering, I can see what you're talking about. I'm going to show you. This might be the most cringeworthy video you've ever seen. My name's Liam C. And I saw your uh, Camden documentary. I think it's amazing. I'm right now, I'm busking around Camden. And I just wanted to play you 30 seconds of my song. And if you like it, I just want to get your reaction. That's it. Okay. Uh, I tell myself, don't stress, things are gonna get better. Got no peace for the week, whatever. Singing in the street, we come playing Coachella. Not a champagne life, but I'm happy with the Stella. Stella, yeah. Listen, aye, and she don't do what they tell her. Ice cream weather, but she's all black leather. Spice like pepper, 10 out of 10 uh. Ain't got a fella, but I'll never see, never lie, no. Uh, how many times can I fall for this? So many nights when my phone don't ring, yeah. Aye, now she's acting all extra. Yeah. I love it, mate. It's so extra. good. No, can I get a hug? So good, so good. Yeah, nice yeah, to meet you. Yeah, of course. Nice to meet you. Legend, yeah. you smashed it on yeah, stage. Yeah, thank you so much. Super sorry, Thank you. Oh my god. Oh my god. Have you ever seen a more uncomfortable and awkward interaction ever in your life? Look at that stop of me. Look at that pause. I'm randomly scrubbing by the video. Look at where I stopped it. Look at her face. Look at dear Dua Lipa's face in this fucking stop. Look at her face. Look at Dua Lipa's face. Look at how uncomfortably, look at how awkwardly uncomfortable she is in this instance. She literally wants to run. She literally wants to walk into a door and be transported to a whole other place. She does not want to be here with Ukulele Boy. Ukulele Boy completely has ruined the vibe of her having a great time at Glastonbury. She's thinking to herself, what the hell am I doing? How did this end up this way? Look at Dua Lipa's face. Look at her. She's like, oh my God. How awkward. How horrible. How cringe. Number one, you have to be a real psycho to go to Glastonbury with a ukulele and ambush people with your songs. We're at Glastonbury, one of the world famous festivals with some of the best artists, musicians, bands, people that make music in the entire world, all congregating in this one field for this one weekend at one of the best festivals in the world. Everybody is at the peak of their profession, is at the peak of their artistry. Professionals, adored, loved, cherished. Why do we want to hear from you and your little Argos ukulele? Leave that shit at home. By the way, have you heard the sound a ukulele makes? When's the last time you heard somebody play a ukulele and thought, oh my God, that sounds amazing. I can't think of one. I can't think of one person, even that dude that does a thing with the rappers. I think it's fucking shit. It's a good piece of content to put out there and shit, but it sounds fucking terrible. Ukuleles are garbage instruments. Same like a fucking recorder. Same thing as a fucking triangle or a tambourine. We don't want to hear it. We're already watching bands. I want to watch Tudor Cinema Club. I want to watch Block Party. 
I want to see the Sugar Babes. I want to see Shania Twain. I want to fucking listen to Coldplay a million times over. I don't want to listen to you play your you fucking ukulele. Absolutely diabolical behavior. But it also reminds me of the countless people we've all seen in our lives, especially in hostels. There's always a guy like this in a hostel. And in a hostel, it's way more embarrassing and way more rage-inducing because the guy in the hostel that always has a guitar or some sort of instrument and he goes to the common area and starts playing it and shit and starts sharing stories about his travels and acting like the fucking big dog, that person is usually very old. Have you noticed that, by the way? It's somewhat admi ad admirable, cute, endearing that this young kid... I hope he's young, by the way, but I think he is young. He does kind of look young. He's got that TikTok haircut, right? So I think he's a young kid. It's almost excusable because he's young. He's trying to find his way. He's looking for a moment. He thinks this is going to be it. He's doing what he needs to do to get out, blah, blah, blah. But it's inexcusable for the guy in the hostel to do it because the guy in the hostel should know better. You're fucking 40 plus years old. You're 50 years old. And you're here where, you know, with that fucking Mexican hoodie thing on, beads on wristbands from all the festivals you've been to over the last decade and shit wearing horrible boots fingernails all over the place scruffy fucking beard you smell like a six-pack and you're playing music for people on your shitty guitar with the same three chords that you've played for the last 10 years that is inexcusable this kid i can kind of understand because you're young you're trying to make your name but if you're an older dude taking an instrument to a festival you deserve to die if you're an older dude going to a festival with an instrument, with the sole purpose of trying to attract younger women, you deserve to be killed. You deserve to die. You actually do. No one deserves to be subjugated to your nonsense, to your noise, to your antics. Leave us alone. We're here to see the experts. We're here to see the pros on the stage. We're not here to listen to you and your fucking, you know, open mic night thing going on. Allow it. But, to be a contrarian, to be a contrarian, I wonder if this interaction, however awkward it was, is a reflection of where we are at in terms of artistry. Maybe, because the level of artistry nowadays is kind of low, Dua Lipa is one of our premier pop stars in music at the moment, She's okay. She's not, you know, she doesn't blow your socks off, but she's okay. Maybe because Dua Lipa is approachable and she's within touching distance, people like the ukulele guy don't think she's that far away in terms of talent in artistry. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe the pop stars and the artists that we have nowadays are just not good enough, just don't have the level of necessary aura to make most rational people be like, oh, I can't play my music to fucking Madonna. That's fucking Madonna. But because it's Dua Lipa, you feel like, why not? I've heard Levitate. All right? I've heard fucking Levitate. My shit slaps too. So maybe it's the fault of these artists and the fact that they're all kind of mid. They're all okay. You know, they play good background music when you're in a lounge bar. They play good music for you to like, you know, go hard on the elliptical. But they're not really changing your world or changing your life fundamentally like a janet jackson like a kylie minogue like a madonna like a lady gaga at her peak these guys are okay so maybe that's why people like the ukulele boy are like you know what i'm gonna sing my song to this guy because really and truly what's the difference between all of us maybe ukulele guy thinks the only difference between him and her is that she has a studio and he doesn't <laughs> yeah <laughs> maybe that's what he thinks he's like hold on you have a studio and I have my iPhone. That's the only difference he probably thinks. Deep down, he probably thinks that. That's where we're at in this culture. But I don't know, man. I just look at that video and I'm like, could you imagine? Could you imagine the ego, the fucking gumption, the balls, right? That you must have to go up to a pop star at a festival. Number one, and disturb them. Leave them alone. I'm a big believer in leaving celebrities alone. Although I've had my bad interactions with DJs and stuff, I think bona fide celebrities who rarely go out, leave them alone. Glastonbury, for some reason, I don't know why, but Glastonbury, for some reason, seems to be the one place that celebrities love to go to. Celebrities love to go to Glastonbury. 
Maybe they all get free tickets. I don't think so personally because it's a very in-demand festival. But you see so many celebrities having a good time at fucking Glastonbury. So clearly, Glastonbury is a good place to go to and to hang out because it's so fucking fun. If that's the case and you see them out there, leave them alone. Do them, do them a favor. Give them a break. You know what I mean? They're not every day they have to be in celebrity mode and take pictures. Leave them alone. But if you are going to say hi, say hi. Make it quick. Stop and chat. No stop and chats. Just a quick drive-by hi. Yo, I love you in so-and-so. Hey, sick seeing you here, man. Enjoy the, enjoy the festival. Boom. A little drive-by acknowledgement. No stopping and give me feedback on my music. Bro, what do you want her to do? She's not an A&R. She's a fucking artist. Leave her alone. But we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised. Because this person called Tom Flannery on Twitter shared this post. Had the worst five days at Glasto with him next to our tent. So I know the pain. Allegedly, this kid <laughs> had been tormenting regular schmegular people at this festival also. Not only Dua Lipa, he'd been tormenting other folks too. So this guy shared this video of ukulele guy tormenting him and his friends at his tent at Glastonbury. Epic, epic shit. The annoying thing about this, I'm not going to lie, the annoying thing about this, I'm not going to lie, I think I'm the guy that's sitting down here drinking the beer, looking at him. In your group of friends, there's always that one friend in your group who doesn't have a good filter in terms of judging who's annoying and who's a psycho. They just allow randoms to come into your group and they kind of encourage and enable them. I do it because it's good banter and it kind of mixes things up and it adds a bit of psycho energy to the fucking group dynamic and just freshens things up a bit. But to everybody else, it could be annoying because they all could have maybe spotted ukulele guy coming from a mile away. They could have all probably been turning away, looking at their phones, trying not to make eye contact. But all it takes is one guy that's sitting down there, fake tapping his head, acting like he's into it to give the guy confidence to be like oh yeah these guys want to see me these guys want to hear me these guys think i'm amazing enabling him encouraging him just for the bants but driving all the other friends fucking crazy i will probably be this guy absolutely diabolical yeah exactly Koyla, exactly Koyla knows exactly Koyla, exactly he knows he knows the ukulele guy plus the drunk dude that wants to freestyle is my nightmare exactly you know what i'm talking about that combo that combo and the other and the other one the one person that's trying to dance to it like <laughs> I'm probably the dancer, the one guy that's trying to dance to, like, create a little moment. And everyone else is just, like, rolling their eyes and wants to fucking, you know, unalive themselves. Just call me the five finger discount here. Or you can save money till I make money. Get it and spend it. I don't save money. It comes to the girls, I ain't sweating it. I'm spending it all for the hell of it. And where it all goes is a red of the Listen, now I ain't even tired. Spend it. Yes. <laughs> What's he doing? Is he doing that for tips? If, is he going around with a little tin cup asking for tips and shit? Is he busking? Is he like maybe trying to make his money back for what he paid for the ticket? Or trying to make some extra money to buy drugs or some shit? If he's doing that, that's way cool. If you go to the Gassenbury with the ukulele and you're like, you know what? I got no money for drugs. I'm just going to play for my drugs. I'm going to play for my drinks. I'm going to play for my dindins. That might be kind of swaggy in a way. Right, just like playing for a fucking bump. <laughs> playing for a pill. Duck digga 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 duck digga 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 dig. But the funny thing I'm just thinking about the Dua Lipa video actually. Thinking about the Dua Lipa video. You know what's really funny about the Dua Lipa video? In most of these instances, when somebody does this sort of thing, you kind of expect them to play the song of the person. It's still a bit awkward anyway, but you'd expect that more. 
than him going up to her and getting her to listen to one of his own songs, isn't it? It's so insane. Like, tell me what you think. Like, what? <laughs> it would make more sense if you went up to her and tried to, like, play her an acoustic version of one of her songs. Like, that actually might make some song, some sense. But playing your own, like, who are you? What? Why? <laughs> oh, she was so uncomfortable. And you know what I love about it, too? The boyfriend is there. The actor dude was there. So this guy ambushed her as she was meeting her boyfriend. The boyfriend guy that she's dating at the moment, he was off camera. He was not worried at all. He actually was like, you deal with that. That's you. He didn't want to get involved. Because when she walks off, you see him at the end. He's actually there. When she, when, when he, when she walks off, you see him there. There he is. He was there the whole time. <laughs> he just didn't want to be part of it. And I love him awkwardly asking her for a hug, by the way, at the end. That was very, very, very cringe. I think the hug, asking about my hug was a bit, maybe worse than the wedding of ukulele. Give me a hug. What did he say? say? Give me a hug. Or where's my hug? What did, what did he say? <laughs> he doesn't even have you know if you play ukulele you have to either sound really good right look at her face oh my god you have to either sound really good playing it or you have to have an amazing voice he doesn't even have a good voice he plays it like shit so it kind of is what it is he basically uses it like a drum it's not even it's, anyway whatever but what does he say to her what words does he say where's my hug what let's see what he says <laughs> I love it, mate. She did. She didn't even let him stop. She didn't even let him finish. I thought she was gonna finish the bar. I love it, mate. It's so good. I love it, mate. <laughs> now I understand. Now I get why. Because sometimes you can take it personally when you're when you ask somebody, "Hey, can I come to the afters? Can you ask your friends if I can come to the afters?" They're like, "Nah, they don't know you." And look, you can be like, oh man, I wish I could go. But this is why people are very protective about afters. Because you never know. And afters, you can't take a chance because you're all locked in this house. So you, you know, it's awkward to kick somebody out. So you have, to, you have to know, when you give that person the postcode, you have to be sure that they're an okay hang, that they're not going to be annoying. They're not going to be a cunt. They're not going to be a prick. They're not going to be weird or a creep. You have to be very sure when you send that person the postcode that you know intrinsically this person's okay because you never know if you roll the dice you might end up with ukulele kid at the door yeah i'm outside yeah it's me i'm outside yuki boy it's uk boy i'm outside like you have to be very very careful can i get a hug oh yuck look she even cringes herself a little bit but she feels bad for him so she gives him anyway can I get a hug? He has everything rolled roll into one, isn't it? He's got that he's got that cringy TikTok haircut. He plays a ukulele, he carries his ukulele around, and he's one of those can I get a hug guys? Where's my hug at? Oh God almighty, man. The trifecta of darkness. I can't believe it, man. Can I get a hug? Can I get a hug? Nice to meet you. Yeah, true. You definitely met her. She definitely doesn't want to meet you ever again. What an absolute psycho of a person, man. Absolute psycho of a person. Legitimate psycho. And I love how there's other accounts of people randomly bumping into him and having the same, same, same experience with him. Absolutely wild. There's actually another video here from 2003 in Park Life. I want the moolah. I want the yellow thing, not the two. Self checkout. I don't know how to use a computer. Five finger discount. Just call me the five finger discount. That's littering. That is littering. Leave no trace. Leave no trace. He's littering. Oh my god. Even more cringe. Even more cringe. Allegedly, he had all these little flyers printed that he sprayed all over the place. Probably using one of those like money gun things with his like Instagram handle on it. Or his socials or something. Maybe a QR code to scan so you can, you know, go to his link tree. Oh, this guy is the worst, bro. This guy is the worst. This guy is the worst. Big up David Guerra. 
at least he hasn't posted anything with featuring Dua Lipa. You don't talk too soon, my friend. David Guerrero, don't talk too soon. That could be next. That could be next. Don't talk too soon. He might have something out on SoundCloud soon. Remix featuring Dua Lipa. Oh my God, this guy is shameless. <laughs> Look at all the things that he's littering all over the place. Honestly, bro. Honestly. The ego that you'd have to have to ambush friends. It's, what, it's bad enough when you do this when you're drunk. And I've been guilty of it myself. When you're at a bar somewhere, you're feeling yourself and you start, you know, ambushing groups of people and start to try to be the fucking jester in front of them and stuff. But usually you're trying to do a little bit of humor dumping and running away. It's still annoying, but whatever it may be. But walking up to a group of friends at a festival, because I don't know about you, but usually when you go with your friends to a festival, I don't know about you, but usually in most cases, if you're with a big group of friends, usually you don't, you guys don't really hang out together a lot. So that festival is kind of a time for you to kind of bond, to see each other, to hang out. The last thing you want is to have strangers, you know, infiltrating your group. That's why maybe sometimes UK festivals can be a little bit clicky because we all work so hard. We all got so many, we got so busy lives. We don't get to see our friends as often as we want to. So maybe a festival is a great time to see your friend. Oh, hey, I got a chance to hang out with you. We get a chance to socialize and chill, listen to our favorite bands, blah, 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 blah. blah. So the last thing you want is to be ambushed by some stranger. And then this guy pulls up with a guitar, with a ukulele. So it's not like, you know, it's bad enough when it's a, a guy like me at a bar, drunk and happy and trying to make jokes. At least, you know, when I, when I, when I have a couple of dead jokes, I'm going to leave. This guy, you have no idea when he's going to leave. That ukulele is a time sink. And the problem with this ukulele guy is, you can have a group of 10 people, but if he gets... One or two encouraging faces, like this girl in the orange, looking kind of happy that he's there. This girl kind of smiling. That girl kind of smiling. He'll never leave. That's the issue. You're going to have some agents of chaos in your group who are going to give him some false sense of encouragement. He's going to get comfortable and it's going to drive all of you fucking crazy. <laughs> and he will never leave because he thinks he's got an audience. He thinks he's got an audience. Like, oh yeah, they're really feeling my shit. Can I get a hug? <laughs> Honestly, I want to rip my face off. I want to rip my face off that he said that to Dua Lipa. Can I get a hug, you know? Honestly, have some shame, man. Have some shame. Have some fucking shame. Honestly, he's doing this. He's he's literally, he's literally a societal terrorist in some regard. He's a festival terrorist. That's what he is. He's a fucking festival terrorist. Talking about terrorism and talking about festivals. Talking about terrorism and talking about festivals. Can we please talk about this video? Can we please talk about one of the funniest videos I've seen in all time? Because this to me demonstrates why a lot of people don't deserve to go outside. Why a lot of people don't know how to hang. Why a lot of people don't know how to vibe. Don't know how to have fun. Don't know how to, you know, just do what you need to do when you go on holiday and you're at a festival, you go to an event, blah, 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 blah. They just don't know what they're doing. They're flipping dumb. Absolutely idiotic when it comes to preparing themselves to go certain places. And the reason why I say this is because of this video that's gone somewhat viral on social medias that features a group of friends who went abroad somewhere to a festival, most likely, maybe to a holiday with their friends and decided to do some trick or some hack they saw on TikTok. These guys saw a TikTok hack that said, if you put your joints in food, like you rolled up your joints, right? You rolled them up and you put them in a piece of sand, uh, inside a sandwich, inside of a hot dog that you could sometimes get through festivals, concerts, club nights, whatever, without them seeing your joints and throwing them away because you're sometimes not allowed to bring them in. These people were so dumb they saw this TikTok video and they assumed it also applied to if you were traveling abroad. And obviously they found out that it doesn't work. That's somebody at an airport. There's a sniffer dog at the feet of these people, obviously black, obviously fucking stupid. 
and the person's going through their luggage because the sniffer dog has sniffed and you know smelled fucking marijuana and is going through their stuff as they were trying to leave the fucking airport. Can you imagine? No, you can't bring the food. Uh, shot glass. Only food? That's the only food. That's the only food, y'all? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. We check, uh, check again. They oh, got more. They got more drugs. that fucking dog, man. That dog, that dog is really rummaging. That dog is really rummaging. Look at that dog. That dog is a fucking knock. That dog is a knock. Look at that dog. <laughs> that dog's like, nah, there's some more things in there. There's some more things in there. Look at that dog. There's some more things in there. Go back, go back, go back, go back. We <laughs> get <laughs> check, uh, checked again. They got more. Oh. They got more drugs. What they got? <laughs> look at the guy looking at the dog. Oh my god. He gave the dog a bad look. Look, the guy gave the dog a dirty look. Look how he's looking at the dog. Nigga, really? Nigga, really? Really? You gonna play me like that, nigga? You gonna play me like that, really? <laughs> Look how he's looking at the dog. Like, <laughs> oh my god! These dogs over here keep harassing us. Oh man, this is too funny. Another person comes. Look what he finds. He finds a joint, of course. So, in general, right? They obviously get in trouble for it. But can you imagine how insane you have to be to try and smuggle joints? weed zoots out from your country to another country pre-rolls can you imagine grinding up weed and trying to smug it out somewhere else by the way this technique this girl's using is mostly for festivals festivals usually don't let you bring in drinks don't let you bring in anything let alone drugs if you go to a festival maybe you might be able to bring in a sandwich this technique is actually pretty decent if i'd go a step further if I was going to a festival, I might get my... She's got a lot of um, pre-rolls in here. But I might get my pre-rolls and I might wrap it in cling film or something. Maybe a Ziploc bag and put it inside of a sandwich. And actually layer it with loads of fucking ham and mayo and shit. So that when they're looking at it through the you know cling film and shit, it just looks like a regular sandwich. That's what I might do. I might go that far. But surely if you're going abroad and you really want to smoke, I think part of the beauty of going abroad and if you really want to smoke... It's finding a local weed shop. They always exist. Most countries that you'd go to, especially if you're going to like a tourist destination, you're not the only person that likes to smoke. There's most likely going to be some sort of weed shop you can find. Maybe through Telegram, maybe through hashtags, maybe through talking to a fucking, you know, a young kid that you see working at a hotel or something or someone at the bar. You can usually find whatever you need at the location. You don't need to smuggle it out of the country you're in and risk fucking prison time. It's not that deep. And guess what? There's another option. If you're going abroad and you're going on holiday somewhere, you're going on vacation, maybe have a break. Maybe abstain from the joints, from the drugs, from whatever you do usually at home and just have some drinks over there, eat some food, get a tan and chill. Maybe it's not that deep. Maybe you don't need to be trying to score drugs everywhere you fucking go or trying to smuggle them out of the country. That is actually some pure nitty addict behavior. It's not that deep. Maybe a festival is quite nice. A festival, don't get me wrong. A domestic festival, putting a couple of joints in a fucking hot dog and putting it in your bag and getting in is quite a smart idea. I've seen other girls do a technique where they put the, where they buy the bottles. I'm sure some of you guys have seen them. There's like water bottles you can buy where they've got like a blank space. They've got like a invisible container section where you can put drugs in there. There's obviously those um, those fobs. I think uh, people sell them like fake key fobs where they've got compartments you can put shit in there. Lighters where it's a fake lighter that you can put shit inside it. You can obviously bull stuff. You can, you know, buff stuff if you need it be. But I think at a festival, it might be worth it. Also at a festival, you're not going to get arrested. At worst, they're going to throw your shit away. But most of the time at a festival, if they find stuff that you're, meant to, you're not meant to take in, usually they'll just confiscate it and you can still go in. So it's not that deep. But if you're going abroad, trying to smuggle stuff out of the country is absolutely insane. 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 
especially ground up weed in a fucking joint. Like, what are you doing? The closest I think you could get away with doing that sort of stuff is maybe ch putting in your check luggage. But still, that stuff still goes through dogs, you know, sniffers and shit and whatever. It's just not worth it. Going on a holiday, it's just not worth it to try and smug us. Like, why would you do that? Just go buy it where you're, where, where, where you're at. It's going to be more annoying, cool. But I think it's similar. I, I attribute those type of things. Again, I'm not really an addict in that way. But I understand the idea of why you want it when you're away somewhere because you know w what better place to enjoy the drugs that you like on vacation that's probably the best place to be but i would approach it the same way that i approach breakfast when i go stay in airbnbs one of the things that i started to do um because in the past i would go stay in an airbnb and i'd kind of use the airbnb as an, as a way to like save money on buy on on eating out because when you go on vacation sometimes you just eat, eat out like three times a day maybe more and you end up spending all your spending money all on fucking food and shit, which can be annoying. So sometimes if I'd get an Airbnb in a country that I was vacationing in, I would sometimes buy breakfast stuff. So I'd go out to a local supermarket in that country and buy bread, eggs and whatever, so that at least in the morning, I could have a coffee and a sandwich and an omelette before I head out. So breakfast kind of covered. But nowadays, I actually enjoy, even if I stay in an Airbnb, not buying anything, and only drinks and actually going out and trying to find a coffee shop to get a coffee because that makes you like go and explore it makes you try and try different places out especially if you're staying for the weekend maybe you might try a different coffee shop every single day of the weekend that you're fucking out there that's actually a good thing to do so maybe with a joint same sort of thing if you're really desperate to have a joint maybe it's advantageous maybe it's beneficial to maybe go out and try and find a local weed man and try and score your stick as opposed to trying to just take the stuff you already have from home and go there because if you get caught Ooh, if you get caught, cool. that's the only thing. the re The reward is amazing. You're on vacation wherever you are. You don't have to go and find some random person. You don't have to wait on a street corner or wait some down some alleyway or meet some non desirable people. You get just to pull it out of your purse, spark it up, and do your thing. But the the negative, if you get caught, cool, I don't know what type type of time that is. I don't know if that's prison time. I don't know if that's a fine. I don't know how it works. But god damn, I'd be fucking scared. That's going to be a scary one. To get pulled into that little room where people get pulled into the room where they're you smuggling and shit and they lay out all your joints on the table. They make you confess and shit. You write a statement, you get your fingerprints, you got like all that oh, that's scary. That's scary. It's bad enough when you go into the airport, you always have that anxiety that you're going to miss your flight. Imagine the extra anxiety of like leaving on your own accord to go to the airport and then leaving the airport in the back of a meat wagon. <laughs> in the back of a police van. That is such an anticlimactic way to deal with your holiday. So I think most people should avoid those type of things and just go and enjoy their trip how they want to enjoy their trip. And if you want to have some fun and get your shit, then ask the local bartender, man. I'm sure there's a little cocktail the guy that work behind the fucking bar serving you the cocktails. Ask him. He probably will let you know. There's probably someone he knows in his phone book who's looking to make some extra money and sell you some fucking oregano. You know what I mean? Like, it's not that deep. It really isn't that deep. But I love how these people completely misinterpreted this TikTok video. This sandwich trick did not work. No, it does work if you're going to a festival. These, these people... These people clearly look like they're at a festival. That's clearly at a festival. She's got a hot dog there, aluminium foil, and she's clearly sitting on the floor somewhere at a festival. Great. That's going to work at a festival because they're not searching you as extensively as they're searching at an airport. But an airport with sniffer dogs? No. Even at, To be fair, even at a UK festival, I'd be scared to do that because some UK festivals, they actually have some crazy security searching fucking things as well. So it's not, you know what I mean? Like, it's not all sunshine and rainbows when it comes to some of these festivals either. So God almighty, always, always watch yourself. Always be careful. Don't take unnecessary risks because it really, really, really and truly is not worth it. But again, what do I know? Absolutely nada okay my friends that has been the agassino zinga show thank you so much for tuning in it's a pleasure it's a pleasure and a chore no it's not a pleasure and a chore it's never a pleasure or a chore to hang out with you and have a good time so thank you for chilling out with me for those of you who are listening via the audio podcast please make sure that you click all the links in the description leave me a five star review if that would be you know not too difficult that would be really 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 nice and all that malarkey 
And for those of you watching via the live stream, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for hanging out. This will be cut up and edited and taking all the gaps and the ums and the ahs out of this and be re-uploaded. So if you see it again, don't be concerned. Don't be scared. Don't be worried. I will obviously keep on continuing doing the way that I'm doing things because why the fuck not? And for those of you listening via the audio side of the podcast and everything else, we will be playing a tune of the day. My tune of the day today, tune of the day today comes from somebody titled Maybe Fratty. Mabe Fratty from an album called Sientre Que No Sabes. And the title of the track is called Enfrenti. That's going to be my tune of the day today. So those of you tuning and checking out the show, the song today is by a person called Mebe Fratty. The song is called Enfrente from their album called Sentry Que No Sabes. I know I probably butchered the title because it's in Spanish. I apologize. But that is my tune of the day today to end the show. Thank you for tuning in to the Agassino Zinga Show. I'll see you guys again very very soon random show in a few hours for those of you who are choosing and to hang out random show in a few hours probably like 11 o'clock my time so come back then for the random show but for now thank you for tuning in tune today playing underneath my voice i'll see you guys again very very soon peace (laughs) 